My name is Shelley Zeger. I'm a businessman living in the state of New Jersey and I'm a Holocaust survivor. I was born in the western part of uh, Uc the Ukraine, which at the time was Poland. And uh, we had a normal life. We were upper middle class uh, people. My father was a uh, businessman uh, supplying steel to the Polish government. And uh, it was a normal life as, as one would have. Little did we know that the world would turn upside down in 1941 when the Messerschmitts attacked our town. Uh, my mother and my brother and I uh, were running up the hill in the farms, uh, hiding from the bombers. We heard the army and tanks coming into the city. We heard the marching, the steps of the German army, the tanks, and the entire world has changed for us in the little shtetl or the little city called Sparov. One of the first things that the Germans did was going to where they found out where the Jewish people were living, or take them out of the houses and take them up on a hill. I remember the hill where the synagogue was and burned the synagogue. Uh, took the Torahs out in the Sidorim and made us watch it. Uh, the next episode that I really remember and it sticks in my mind is the fact that they were going to collect all the young boys, the Jewish boys. And my mother dressed me and my brother in uh, dresses and put kerchiefs on our heads and uh, um, made us go into our uh, neighbor, whose name, by the way, was Axelrod. And uh, we were mingling with the girls. They were, had a lot of girls there, so they put us among the girls in this way. Uh, when the Germans came to inspect for boys, we were two girls, and that sort of stuck in my mind and was a very humiliating episode at the time for me. In a matter of months, they formed a ghetto. And the ghetto, we misuse that word, the ghetto, in this country. A ghetto is not a place where just a conglomerate of people like Jewish people live in one neighborhood or Irish people or the African-American people or the Latino. Uh, a ghetto, you can't get out of a ghetto. It's barbed wire guards and uh, you, uh, are, you are in that place for one reason and one reason only. So the Germans didn't have to go from house to house and find out whether you're Jewish or you're Ukrainian or you're Pole for the Aktia. Our Aktia was when they would round up the Jews, either take them to camps uh, or shoot them or create scenarios where they would actually uh, take them on trains to Germany, labor camps, and humiliate them. We uh, wound up in the ghetto. The living conditions in the ghetto were absolutely horrible. Uh, 15, 20 families to a house, uh, filth, hunger. Uh, I remember very distinctly the wagons with bodies, typhoid, uh, different diseases, uh, people dying of diseases and, and humiliating by the German guards, the Ukrainian guards. Uh, I recall one particular incident where they actually took uh, three Jewish men and they buried them alive with their heads sticking out and they were target practicing and uh, the uh, soldiers were actually drunk and uh, it was like a miracle that they didn't actually kill them and uh, they were laughing and they were um, uh, making fun of it and they made us watch it. Uh, so the humility and the, the, the how the atrocities that were perpetrated on, by humans, to humans, was absolutely unbelievable. So this type of lifestyle was continued and um, we were in, in the ghetto for approximately a year. From time to time, trucks would come in and they would load up the trucks to take him. That was already after they built concentration camp and the word got out that uh, 
uh, Hitler and his gang uh, uh, pronounced the, the, the annihilation of the Jewish people. When my dad, who was an entrepreneur, um, this found out from various sources that the last trucks would be coming in to, uh, to get the last Jewish people to take them to a concentration camp. He paid off some guards or he, I don't know, he schmoozed around whatever he did for us to be able to escape. The problem was, where do you go? We had a, a, uh, a town's fool, and his name was Anton Sochinsky. And the reason they called him the town's fool is because uh, he was eccentric. But my mother used to invite him and uh, make a vegetable soup and give him tomatoes and cucumbers and treat him and honor him and feel uh, a, a real true friendship of uh, humanity. My mother had a dream. The dream was of her mother, who was dead at the time. So she asked her dead mother, what should we do? Where should we go with the kids and my husband? And the answer of uh, her mother was, um, you go to Anton Sochinsky. We escaped uh, May 12th uh, about uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And the reason I know it was May 12th, because that's my birthday. At that time, I was about uh, seven years old. My father would take me, and uh, because we didn't have shoes, so he would take me about a hundred yards and put me down, and then he would go back uh, to uh, pick up my brother and take him where they dropped me off. And my mother was the accompanist, so she would stay with one of us at the time. We came to Anton, and we told him that we have no place to go. Uh, would he take us in? And with open arms, he embraced us. He said, uh, we will do whatever it takes to save you and your family. Little did we know that uh, he also made arrangements to have uh, one girl that he had was trying to save. And my dad, uh, through Inigato, uh, made a uh, promise to uh, one of our friends, I guess his friends, to save their daughter. Her name was Eva, Eva Adler, and, uh, and the other girl was Fagler. Anton took us in and he put us in his brother's uh, farmhouse on top of the, uh, uh, on, on the second floor, above the, and, and it's like a, an attic of a, of a uh, hay and cow uh, house. And we were there for 18 days while uh, my father and my uh, and Anton dug a shelter underneath the cellar. How do you do that without exposing that you are saving Jews? Because everyone was after uh, the Jews because uh, there were rewards given to some of the Ukrainians and the Poles that if you if you found some Jews, you would get X amount of zlotis. That's their their currency. Uh, so Anton, as, uh, even though he was known as the town's fool in his wisdom, uh, he would take my father and he would build a, a shelter at nighttime. And they would put the dirt in their pockets and then would go out and they would spread it. And then Anton would take pepper and human waste and put it on top of the dirt because he knew that the Germans are going to come with dogs and to, uh, to sort of uh, confuse the dog's sense of smell, uh, he put human, he got pepper and human uh, waste. I remember when we came into the shelter, the shelter was a, a rectangular uh, hole underneath the cellar uh, where uh, only uh, three people, the width of the, of the sh uh, shelter, was so narrow that only three bodies could lay and on each side it was long but it was it was very narrow so we had three people my father my mother and I on one side and our feet were touching I was touching my brother's feet and uh, my father was touching Eva's feet and my mother was touching Feigl's feet so we, it was like a deck of cards 
and no one could really get up. I mean, the, the shelter was wet. It was like a grave. It was an a oversized uh, grave, uh, strictly by candlelight. Uh, we had uh, two holes. One was a hole that was going into the cellar under which our shelter was built. And the other one was going through a, uh, the house of a chimney where he created a pulley with rope. And every day he would um, uh, lower three buckets. And the three buckets were one empty and one with water and one with potatoes and bread. And the empty one, uh, and when he would lower the three buckets, he would take the three buckets from our uh, shelter. Uh, one was full of waste and human needs, and the two others, the water and the food, was empty. So that was a rotation that every day he would, uh, he would try to feed us. And there were, there were times that we told him, Anton, it's, uh, it's just too much. Um, we, we can't stand it. Let us go in and, 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 and get this over with. And he said, no, I'm the captain of this ship and we all die or we all will make it. In all honesty, uh, would they have found us in Anton's place, he probably would have been shot first. Because that, to make an example on people that were trying to help Jewish people. So we lived there in, in the shelter for um, approximately somewhere between 15 to 22 months. We were liberated by the Red Army. The front between the Russian Red Army and the Germans was in our city. And therefore, the Germans used the cellar for their people, for the German army. So they were right above us, and Anton couldn't deliver uh, any food or water. And we were, like, we were like this for about eight days. And we heard the Germans above us, and they were eating chocolate, and they were laughing, and they were having all kinds of fun. And here we are, dying of hunger and thirst. Uh, we had to resort to uh, some of us, not all of us, but some of us, uh, to resort to drink our own urine for, uh, as water. I did, and so did my mother. Uh, and then all of a sudden there was like a quietness. And it was for a period of time. And my brother went out because he was the closest to the hole to go into the cellar. And apparently when he got to the cellar, he stuck his head out to, to see what's going on. And he saw the Red Army coming in. And he cried out, it's over, it's over. We are, we are free, we are free. We went out of the cellar and they uh, gave us water and um, they told us not to drink too quickly, not to eat too much. Because we were in the air uh, for that period of time and we were, uh, the sun, it was in April that we were liberated and it was a sunny day. The sun hit our, our uh, bodies and we swell up. We swelled up to a point that we, didn't, uh, we couldn't see, we couldn't do anything. They had to take us to an army hospital, uh, a field hospital. And we stayed in the field hospital for about a, a couple of weeks to get back, on, back to, uh, to normalcy. There were only two families that wound up uh, surviving. Um, and that was the Kroinish family and the Ziegler family. So we lived together in the house. And my father uh, decided that having gone through the First World War and then of course the Second World War, that the best thing to do is to move west. So when we parted with Anton, uh, we begged him to come with us. And he said no, he was born in Zborov and he wants to die where he was born. And so my mother made arrangements with him that wherever we go, wherever we settle, that we are communicate. The problem was that 
Anton didn't write nor read. So the deal was that they would write, we would write a letter, my mother would write a letter to him, and he in turn would go to a neighbor that he could trust. And they would read the letter to him, and then he would dictate a letter back, and then he would put a flower. If you put a flower on his letter and mailed it, my mother would know that that he, re he received the letter. We were in, in Germany, near Munich, uh, and we, there, we were there from 1946 to 1949. And during that time, uh, I was going to school, I learned Hebrew. Uh, I had no schooling at all when I was liberated because between the Russians coming in and then the Germans coming in, and I was too young to go to school. So. Uh, I had no schooling at all when I was liberated in 1944, and I was nine years old already. In 1949, we were going to go to Israel. We loaded the ship, and we were going to go to Israel when my aunt in Newark, New Jersey, uh, Celia Wax, her name is Celia Wax, sent us papers that we can come to the United States. And my father here again had to make a decision. Everything that he worked for the last three years was already on a ship for Israel. And here we have papers to go to the United States. And a decision, he said, that was no decision. Let everything go. We're going to America. We're going to America. We and about 1,300 other Jews were on a General McRae ship heading for New York City. And that trip, I will never forget. We came in around four o'clock in the morning. It was a hazy early morning. And we saw the Statue of Liberty. The crying that was going on. was just unbelievable that we made it. We actually made it. We uh, settled in Newark. They put me in the first grade of grammar school. Uh, you've got to remember, I was like 13 and a half, 14 years old, but I didn't speak English, so I went to Elliott Street School in, in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And in six months, I graduated eight grades of school and skipped the first year of high school in Weequack High School and graduated Weequack High School in 1953. Uh, went to Seton Hall University for a year and decided that I wanted to become a citizen and I had to wait too long uh, to go through the regular uh, way so I joined the United States Army. I had an unbelievable experience. I got my citizenship papers in Macon, Georgia as an Army person. I volunteered for two years and it was the best decision that I ever made. In 1970, I took a shot and I came to Trenton to buy a company that was broke, a liquor wholesale. And my partner came to me and said, you speak Russian, you speak Ukrainian, you speak all those languages. How would you like to go back to Russia to start business? And I uh, was reluctant at first, uh, but then I thought it was an important uh, mission. Having gone back to Russia, I f was able to find out through a lot of circumstances that Anton Sochinsky was still alive. We thought that he died because when we were, my mother was sending packages and letters, the letters in the beginning in the 60s, the letters were coming back with the flower and then they stopped co coming back with the flower and we sent the Red Cross asking them to find out what happened to Anton Sukinsky, And they came back and they said that the house is there, but he is not there. Having found, that, found out that he is alive, we rebuilt his house and we went there, my mother and my brother and our wives to Kotosboro. We found Anton and uh, maybe a thousand people came to see us. It was an unbelievable uh, happening in Zborov. 
Now he has a, a museum named Anton Sokinski, and there you have declarations of a Gentile that uh, saved Jews. His name is inscribed in Yad Vashem next to Schindler. As you come into Yad Vashem, his name is very prominent. This town's fool was the town's hero. It's like a, a full circle. My life has been a full circle. Uh, uh, and, and, and if one thinks about all the things that I have been able to accomplish and done, uh, it all is circular. It all comes back and it all, uh, and it is uh, an unbelievable journey that I had so far.